Hey, good morning, South Park. We're excited to have another Sunday with you. Those of you that are joining us online today, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with your church family, even in your home. We love you guys and we miss you. And we're looking forward to another great service today. We know Pastor Chad is going to be wrapping up his sermon series in the book of Genesis for the summer and beginning a new one real soon. Also, we've got a special visitor today. Our missionary with Casas for Cristo, Brendan, is going to be joining us and talking to us for just a moment about what Casas for Cristo does and how our church has joined with them this past year. So we're looking forward to all those things today. God bless you guys, and we'll be starting up soon.
Jesus this morning. Good morning. My name is Shandar Hobbs, and I have the honor and privilege of welcoming you to uh, the House of Worship this morning. If you are here in the building, we are so glad to see your eyes this morning. And if you are uh, joining us online, thank you so much for being part of uh, what we have to offer today. I have a few announcements for you. We have the privilege of opening our nursery for all children four years old and younger next week. So please be looking at your email so that you have all of the safety precautions that are in place and that you follow those. We're so grateful for the opportunity to be in God's house. And um, with that comes some different things that we're doing. And we're so grateful that you're following those guidelines. We also have an opportunity to give to uh, two missions that are happening here in our area to um, support women's shelters and in sex trafficking. Being on the outskirts of a large urban city, we have a major problem in this area. And so the Gulf Coast Association and Elijah Rising have been part of supporting women's So if you would like to be part of that, please put in the memo of your special offering in trafficking, and that will go to support those ministries. So um, it's been a week, right? Uh, Some of you kids started school on Monday and Tuesday, and then you were out for two days. And finances and fear and life and heartbrokenness, right, have enveloped us this week. And so I wanted to share with you from Matthew 11:28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My prayer for you today is that you lay everything at the feet of Jesus, and through the music, and through Pastor Chad, and through Matt's words, and the verses that we're going to read in the Bible today, that God would take all those heavy burdens away, and you would leave here renewed and restored. And if you're not part of our family, that you would come be part of the family of God, whether you're physically here or you're with us on the internet. So just know you are welcome today. Shandor, you you might end up with a full-time job doing that every week. That was really good. (laughs) Hey, we got a real quick, we got a special guest here in our service today who is the missionary with Casas Per Cristo, and that's who our church has joined up with this past year to do mission trips over in Mexico. Um, he's going to come up for just a second and talk about that ministry. Let's, let's give a hand to the missionary, Brendan Norper. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am Brendan Norper, like... Matt said, I'm a missionary with Casas Por Cristo. Um, I've been doing it for about three years now, um, and I just wanted to take some time to share a little bit about our ministry and what we do. That way you are aware of that and um, just know a little bit more about what we do. Um, So Casas opens up the door to minister to families in uh, Latin American countries. Um, and so we work in Nicaragua, Guatemala, the Dominican Republic, um, and Acuna in Juarez, Mexico. And um, so what we do is we partner with the local pastors in each of our locations. Um, and uh, so in each of our locations, we have pastors that we partner with and we um, provide, provide homes for families in need. Um, So as teams sign up, like churches like South Park, um, they sign up to build in one of our locations, and then um, we assign a family to that team, and the team will come down to that location, and one of our missionaries like myself will um, spend three or four days with the team, um, and we will build a home for a family. Um, And so this past spring break, we were, South Park was able to come down to Acuna, and build a home for Brenda and Jose. Um, And not only that, but also provide um, the funds for a bathroom and a mini split air conditioner slash heater. Um, And so uh, what I love about our ministry is that we not only do short-term mission trips with churches and groups and teams, um, but we also also combine short-term missions with long-term ministry because in each of our locations, we have a group of pastors that we work with, 
um, and they are the ones who are doing most of the ministering. When we build, we minister with the families. They're there during the week. Um, the pastors are usually there, so we get to interact with them. Um, but we, but once the team has gone back home, um, the pastors are continually ministering to these families. Um, and it's just an awesome experience to be able to um, share the love of Christ with these um, families. Um, and we're creating an opportunity for these pastors to get to know these families if they um, aren't really, if they aren't involved in their church, or if, even if they are, to be able to truly know who Christ is and that He loves them, and that um, you know, there's more. You know, that Christ has, you know, has offered His life um, for them, but also that um, living a life worthy of um, Christ is um, an amazing blessing. And so. Um, uh, about in a year, every year we build around three ho- house, three hundred homes, um, and each, you know, in ev- all of our locations combined. And so, um, you know, every year thousands of people are hearing the gospel through teams like South Park, um, and it's just an a- amazing opportunity to be able to work with um, your church and um, your team that came down. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, man. He drove all the way from Del Rio just to tell you guys, no, we're friends. He came to see me. <laughs> no, uh, man, we just uh, th- thankful for him and uh, being able to join up. Looking forward to next spring break to doing that as well. Uh, church, we just wanted to emphasize this morning through our music, and I know Chad will through the message. There's no one like Jesus, right? Mm. There's no one like our God, amen? amen. And so we want to sing uh, this last. Oh, come on, man. We can applaud him. Yeah, he's worthy. <laughs> Sometimes we get so Baptist, we start to clap, and we're like, oh, can I do this? Uh, <laughs> always worthy of a hand clap. Uh, so we just wanted to uh, finish off by singing, His Name is Wonderful. Oh, His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. This morning, Heavenly Father, we do uh, join in that song saying, You are wonderful. You are an amazing God. And Lord, let us not lose sight of that. You are worthy of our honor. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our applause. You are worthy, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, now as we look at your word and how you have worked in this world in the past, may we once again be in awe of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if I were you to tell you my life story, it would have to begin back in the summer of 81. My dad was a youth minister, and he had a busy summer planned. My parents had one son already. He was going to turn four in October, and they had another child on the way who was supposed to be born after that fourth birthday in October. 
It's a busy summer for youth minister, October, clear as day on the calendar. So my mom and my older brother were going to take one last trip. You get one last trip before the doctors say you can't travel anymore. They're going to go to New Mexico, see my aunt and uncle, spend some time there. My dad was going to Louisiana on a mission trip. It's going to be one last hurrah, then back home, wait it out, be ready for October to come. But the air conditioning went out at my parents' house. They had to spend money on that. They didn't want to spend money on the trip. Instead, my mom and older brother went to Pasadena to hang out with her parents for the week while my dad was gone. And it's a good thing. Because at my grandparents' house, my mom went into labor in August, not October. And so my grandma, my Aunt Robin, my mom start heading across town. I don't really know why they went across town. Like, there's hospitals all over the town, right? I don't know why you have to get back to your hospital, but you have to get back to your hospital. And so they did, almost didn't make it back to Memorial City Hospital in time. Uh, but thankfully, they did, and Brad was born. And then five minutes later, Chad was born. Surprise! <laughs> They thought they were having one child. Uh, they didn't realize they were having twins. Uh, there was only supposed to be one baby. So my Aunt Robin called my dad. Hey, uh, you have twin boys. My dad's like, no, <laughs> quit messing with me. What's going on? Is Debbie okay? Is everything all right? No, you have twin boys. You better get back here fast. He hung up the phone on her. He didn't believe my aunt. <laughs> She called him back. He believed her the second time. Came back home. All was good. Uh, so they didn't know what to call us. Uh, they, we didn't come out and they called us Chad and Brad. Uh, they, uh, they didn't know what to call us. And so my granddad's like, well, what names are you thinking? I'm like, well, we were choosing between Brad and Chad. And he's like, well, put them in alphabetical order. Uh, make sure. I mean, that just makes it logical, right? And so if you're ever wondering who comes first. Needless to say, that wasn't the plan, right? That wasn't my parents' plan. They, they thought they were going to have one child in October, making two total for their family. Now they have two in August, making three total for their family. Have to spend four or five weeks, four for me, five for my brother, at the hospital, looking after two premature babies now. Not what they had planned. But life works that way, doesn't it? It doesn't always go the way we planned it. Actually, hardly ever goes the way we have planned it. So our choice is, how are we going to respond in the midst of the craziness of life? And who are we going to turn to when life doesn't go the way we expect it to go? Now, you don't need to hear my whole life story this morning. You probably heard more of it than you really cared to hear this morning. But there is somebody's life story that is worth hearing this morning. But to get there, we need to kind of bridge from where we were last week to where we're going this week. So last week we have Abraham, who's got this promise from God for him and his descendants. He has a son named Isaac, the promise is going through him. Isaac gets married to Rebekah. They have twin boys, Esau and Jacob, in that order, by the way. And so Esau is the one who the line should go through. But Jacob, he, he buys Esau's birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. Which, by the way, if you've had lentil stew, it's really good. Put some lemon in it. It's phenomenal. Uh, there's Empire Church Grill Memorial. Anyway, uh, but I don't think it's worth selling your birthright for. And then Jacob tricks his blind father into blessing him instead of Esau, his brother. And so now the line's going through Jacob, the second born. And Esau's not too happy about that. And so Esau wants to kill Jacob. Jacob goes running. Also, by the way, his parents say, while you're back in the land where our people come from, find a wife. And instead of finding one wife, he finds four wives. It doesn't always go so well. So four wives, 11 kids later, he comes back to the land, uh, comes back to Esau. There's forgiveness that happens between them. Another child is born in the land, making 12 total. And Jacob, though, has a favorite wife, Rachel. And Rachel passes away at the birth of that 12th son, Benjamin. And Jacob doesn't just have a favorite wife. He also has a favorite child, which gets us 
to Genesis chapter 37. We'll see how that goes here. So Jacob is back in the land of his fathers. He's back dwelling there. And some of his sons are keeping the sheep with Joseph. Joseph's 17 years old at the time. And after they go keep those sheep, Joseph comes back and he says to his father, and he gives a bad report on those brothers he's with. Now, Jacob loved Joseph more than he loved any of his other children. And so he gave him a long coat that reached to his extremities. Most of the time it says it's a multicolored coat. Uh, They usually were multicolored, but it's actually a long coat. Long sleeves, long hem. The point is it's a manager's coat. It's the coat that somebody in charge would wear. And this is the younger brother. He's 17 years old. He's not the youngest, but he's one of them. And he's now wearing this manager's coat. So needless to say, his brothers hated him. They didn't like him one bit. And so Joseph tells his brothers, I had a dream. There were 11 sheaves of grain. They were your sheaves, and they were bowing down to mine. And his brothers said, you think we're going to bow down to you? And they hated him even more for that. And, and then Joseph had another dream. And he said, there's the sun and the moon and 11 stars, and they're bowing down to me. And this time his brother, his dad gets in on it. He says, he rebuked him. He said, you think your mom and I and your brothers are going to bow down to you? And his brothers hated him again for it. But his dad, his dad took note of this. And as time went on, the brothers were keeping the sheep down in Shechem. And so his dad said, go and seek the shalom of your brothers. Now, those same brothers could not speak shalom to Joseph. Shalom is peace, completeness, wanting well-being for somebody. It was the greeting that this family used. And they could not speak shalom to their brother. But now Joseph is supposed to go seek the shalom of his brothers, see how they're doing. And so the dad sends him to Shechem. He goes to Shechem. The brothers aren't there in Shechem. He's looking around in the fields, and a man says, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for my brothers. They're supposed to be keeping the sheep. He said, I heard that they went down to Dothan. And so Joseph goes down to Dothan to find his brothers. And as he is headed to Dothan, the brothers see him from far away and say, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. Let's throw his body in a pit. We'll take his bloody coat back to our father. That's not the Sunday school version, is it? But that's, that's what we find in here. Uh, take his bloody coat back to our father. But Reuben, the oldest, says, no, 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 no. Let's not take his life. Let's just put him in the pit. And Reuben's got this plan. He's going to rescue him out of the pit and return him to his father. But, but that's not what happens because... Judah sees some Ishmaelite traders coming by. And he says, well, what does it profit us to kill him? Let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. And so the Ishmaelite and Midianite traders are together, and they sell Joseph to these traders. Now, an interesting note, by the way, is do you know where the Ishmaelites and the Midianites come from? These are sons of Abraham that form these two groups of people. These are like their second and third cousins. So they're selling their brother to their second or third cousins to take him down to Egypt. <laughs> Anybody's family resemblance here, right? <laughs> All right, sorry. Everybody's got a stream of that family in your life, right? Uh, anyway, so they, they're selling them back to Egypt. And so now Joseph finds himself in Egypt sold to Potiphar. You get to the next chapter in Genesis, and it kind of takes a different direction. It seems like a side trail. It's actually a very important story about Judah's life. I encourage you to read it this week. And if you do read it this week, come and talk to me about it, because you'll probably have some questions about what happens with Judah and Tamar. But then we get back to Joseph's story in chapter 39. We find even more about Potiphar. We find that he is the captain of the guard. He's an official in Pharaoh's house. And when Joseph is in Potiphar's house, we find that the Lord is with him. And Potiphar realizes that the Lord is with him. And everything that Joseph does prospers. 
It, it does well. And so Potiphar puts him in charge of everything, in charge of the whole house. And, and so Joseph is there in charge of the whole house for a while. And while Potiphar notices that God is with Joseph, Potiphar's wife notices that Joseph is an attractive young man. So she says, hey, come, come lie with me. And, and so Joseph says to Potiphar's wife, your husband has put me in charge of everything in his house. There's nothing that he has kept from me except for you. I cannot do this thing in sin against God. Time and again, Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph. So there's one day when there's no household servants in the house when Joseph goes to do his work that day. And, and so Potiphar's wife grabs Joseph by the coat and says, lie with me. And, and he leaves his coat behind in her hand and he runs away from her. And seeing that his coat is in her hand, she hollers out and gets all the household servants to come see, says, see See what has happened. This Hebrew has come to laugh at us. Now, laughter in Isaac, Jacob's, or Joseph's grandfather, that's the same name. And it's a term that means to laugh, to joke, to play, to flirt, maybe a little bit more. And so she's using a term from his family line. He's come to Isaac at me. Another thing to note real quick before we move on is what got Joseph in trouble in the beginning? How did his father show favoritism? He gave him a special coat, right? How did they recognize him? They took that coat back to his father with goat blood on it to make his father think that he had died. The coat plays a role in the story. Now, it's a different word, but still a garment is now in Potiphar's wife's hands. Pay attention to clothes and the rest of the story. So calls the household servants in. This Hebrew has come to laugh at us. When Potiphar comes home, he said, That Hebrew who you brought into our house has come to laugh at us. Now Potiphar is upset and throws Joseph into prison. The, the king, the Pharaoh's prison, the prison actually that's at the captain of the guard's house. So he's still at his own house. Now he's in prison there. But Joseph in prison, he once again has the Lord with him. And everything he does prospers. So much so that the guy in charge of the prison just puts everything in Joseph's care. So Joseph is in charge of all of the prison now. And anything that needs to happen, Joseph is in charge of it. Now, after a time, there are two people in Pharaoh's house that upset Pharaoh, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And they're put in prison, and they're put into Joseph's care there in prison. And, and after a time in prison, there's a day where they both come out waking up, and they're, they're distraught. And Joseph says, well, what's wrong with you? They said, well, we each had a dream last night, but there's nobody here to interpret dreams. Joseph says, well, doesn't God give the interpretation of dreams? Tell me what your dreams are. And so the chief cupbearer says, I, I saw a vine, and it had three branches, and it bloomed, and it had all these grapes, and I took the grapes, I squeezed them in a cup, and then I took that cup and gave it to Pharaoh. He said, well, that, that dream means in, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, and you will once again place the cup in Pharaoh's hand. He said, but when you do, remember me. Because I was sold into slavery in Egypt. I didn't do anything wrong. And then I was placed in prison for something I didn't do wrong. And so please remember me. Get me out of here. And the second, the baker saw the dream of the cupbearer, and he saw that it was a good interpretation. So he asked him what the meaning of his dream was. He said, I have three cake baskets on my head. The top one has all kinds of different breads. And then all these birds start eating the bread out of the top basket. He says, your dream also will happen in three days. And your head will be lifted up. And then you'll be hanged by Pharaoh. 
And in three days, both of their heads were lifted up, the chief cupbearer back to his place, the chief baker back now to death by being hanged. But the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. For two years, he did not remember Joseph. So one night, Pharaoh has two dreams. And all the magicians and all the people in the court of Pharaoh, nobody can interpret those dreams. And the cupbearer remembered Joseph. And he said, there was this Hebrew in prison when we had dreams, the chief cupbearer, me and the chief baker, and he interpreted those dreams. And it came true what he interpreted. And so they went and got Joseph out of the pit. Where did his brothers put him? He went and got Joseph out of the pit. He shaved. He changed his clothes. He came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh told him his dreams. First dream, seven beautiful fat cows by the Nile River. And then seven like sleek, ugly cows came along, and they ate the fat cows, but they were still sleek and skinny afterwards. And then there were seven heads of grain, plump and, and wonderful. And then seven scrawny, like heat-ridden heads of grain came and ate the other ones. But they were still scrawny. And so Joseph says, your dreams are two in one. They're the same dream. The seven plump, fat cows, the seven healthy heads of grain, those are seven years of plenty. The seven ugly cows and the seven scrawny heads of grain, those are seven years of famine. So they will have seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And so store up grain in those seven years of plenty. Get one-fifth of the grain of all the land, put it in storehouses, so that when those years of famine come, you will be ready. The Lord has revealed this to you so that you will be ready for this. And he's given you two dreams to make sure you know this is for sure going to happen and it is not going to delay. So make sure you put somebody in charge of all this. And so Pharaoh looks around and he says, I need somebody who is filled with God to take care of this. And seeing nobody else, he puts Joseph, now 30 years old, in charge of this. He puts a signet ring on his finger. He gives him a garment of linen to wear, showing that he is in charge of everything. He gives him a chariot to ride in. And he puts people in front of him saying, bow down to Joseph. What were those dreams that Joseph had? So Joseph is in the land. He also gives him a wife, by the way, in the seven years of plenty Joseph prospers himself. He has two children. He has Manasseh. And he names his son Manasseh because he says, The Lord has made me forget my affliction and my family. And then he has another son named Ephraim. And he says, The Lord has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. People give people names for a reason, particularly in the Old Testament. You can see a little bit of Joseph's perspective at this point in time. And so these seven years of plenty end, and then the seven years of famine begin. But it's not just for Egypt that there's famine in the land. There's famine in all of the land, including the land of Canaan, including where his dad and his brothers are. And so his dad says to his sons, why are you here? Why are we starving? There is grain in Egypt. Go and get some. And so he sends ten of his sons. He keeps Benjamin behind, the only other son of his favorite wife, Rachel. And the other ten go to Egypt. And they go, and everybody has to buy grain from Joseph. And so they go and bow down in front of Joseph. And Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And Joseph remembers those dreams that he had. And Joseph is harsh towards his brothers. He said, where'd you come from? They said, Canaan. He said, you're spies. You're spies in our land. No, 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 we're not spies. We've never been spies. Not a day in our life have we spied on anything. Back in 37, right at the beginning of this story, 
Joseph's with some of his brothers. They're watching the sheep. He comes back and he brings a report to his dad, a bad report. He doesn't tell us what they think of him. But what do you think they think of him? He's a spy. He's a tattletale. You're spies in our land. And we're not spies. We, we are 12 sons of one father. Uh, one is no more. One still with our father. We are not spies. So if you're not spies, then send one of you back and go get that one brother and bring him back here. And I'll keep the rest of you in custody until then. What, 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 they don't know what to do. And so Joseph puts all ten of them in prison for three days. And on the third day, he brings them out of prison. He says, okay, I'll send nine of you back. I'll keep one. But you don't come back here to get grain or anything else unless you bring your youngest brother with you. So Simeon is bound in their presence and taken into custody. And they are sent away their bags full of grain, and Joseph instructs, put the money back in the top of their sacks. And so they go on this journey, they get back to the first stopping point, they open the bag to feed their animals, and they find that there is their silver still in their bag. They said, oh no, what has God done to us? And they go on back to the land of Canaan, and they recount all of what's happened to their father. Their father's mad. They said, why did you tell him you had a brother? And I said, he pressed us. He asked us. We didn't know that if we told him we were going to have a, if we had a brother, that he would make him come back. And Reuben says, let us go back. Let us take Benjamin with us. If anything happens to him, you can kill my two oldest children. Now, Reuben's the oldest. He's trying to take responsibility here. But, Judah, uh, but uh, Jacob does not listen to him. They eat all of the grain that they have there in the land until they have no more grain left. And so Jacob says, go get more. So we can't. We can't go get more grain unless you send Benjamin with us. He said, I can't. So Judah steps up. And Judah says, I will, I will watch over Benjamin. If anything happens to him, you can blame me for it. All the days of my life, you can blame me. And at that, Jacob lets Benjamin go under Judah's care. And they head back to Egypt, and they come before, Jacob, or before Joseph again. And when Joseph sees Benjamin... He's overcome. And he says, let's kill the calf. Let's invite him to lunch. And they get to go eat lunch with this main guy in charge of all the land of Egypt. But they are worried about it. And so they go to his steward when they get there. They say, well, we had extra money in our sacks. We don't know what happened to it. So we brought more money this time. We didn't mean anything of it. And the steward said, well, I got all your money last time. God must have blessed you. So they thought God was cursing them when they found the money. The steward in Egypt sees God as blessing them. Simeon comes and joins his brothers at this feast laid out for lunch. And all of the brothers sit at the table from oldest to youngest. And they are in awe that, that they are in order from oldest to youngest. Joseph sitting at a table by himself. The Egyptians are sitting at a table by themselves because the Egyptians can't eat with the Hebrews because it's an abomination to the Egyptians. And there's this crazy dinner party going on. And the brothers are served off of Joseph's table. And each of them get a good portion of food. But Benjamin, he gets five times as much food as anybody else. And they all notice that he gets five times more food than anybody else. And so then, then Joseph looks at this. And he says, okay, y'all go on your way. He tells his steward, put their money back in their sack, but put my silver cup in Joseph's sack. 
So he places his silver cup back in Joseph's sack. And he sends them on the way that morning. And he sends a steward not very far after him, catches up with them pretty quickly that day. He says, why did you steal his silver cup? Don't you know that my master can practice divination? And they said, we didn't steal his silver cup. If any of us have his silver cup, we will all be your slaves. And whoever has it, you can put him to death. He said, no, no, no. Well, I'll just take him as a slave. Don't worry. And the rest of you can go free. And so they look for the cup, oldest to youngest. And when they get to the youngest, to Benjamin's bag, what do they find? They find the silver cup there. He says, y'all can all go free. And they all pack up their stuff there in mourning. They go back to Joseph's house. And Joseph says to them, oh, well, you don't have to all stay. I I just want the one who stole my cup. He will be my servant. You can all go back to your father in shalom, in peace. I'll just keep him. But Judah, Judah steps up and says, no, 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 no. I cannot let that happen. He recounts all that's happened in their family's story. He says, I made a promise to my father that I would not let anything happen to him. I cannot go back to my father. He will go to his grave in sorrow if Benjamin doesn't come back. Take me instead. Why does Joseph make him go through all this? Is he just trying to get back at him? Is he just upset at him? What did they do to him? Daddy's favorite. They sold him off into slavery in Egypt. It was an easy fix for them. It was a selfish thing for them. So what situation has he put them in? He doesn't know if Benjamin's the favorite at this point or not. But he makes him out to be the favorite, right? He gives him five helpings of food. He treats him differently. And then he sets them up to be able to have Benjamin be the scapegoat. To be the one that they give up. Okay, well you keep Benjamin and we're headed back home. All right, tough luck for you, but peace for us. He sets them up to see if they will do the same thing to another son of Rachel that they did to him. And Judah, Judah's the one who spoke up to sell him into slavery in Egypt. And now Judah's the one speaking up to save his brother from slavery in Egypt. So this, Joseph is greatly moved by seeing the change that's happened in his brother's life. And he has everybody leave the room. And he says to his brothers, I am Joseph. And they are speechless. He says, no, I am Joseph, the one you sold into slavery in Egypt. Don't be angry or upset at yourselves. Because what you meant for evil, God used to save all of these lives. He needed me here to make sure that there was some way to save people in the midst of this famine. God put me here. He said, how is our father? Is he still alive? And he hugs Benjamin and he cries On his neck, and then he hugs and kisses each of his brothers. And they finally begin to talk to him. And Pharaoh hears the great welling, and he hears that Joseph's brothers have come to Egypt. And he says, Send wagons, bring them all back. I'll take care of everybody. Bring your family to Egypt. And so Joseph invites his whole family to come to Egypt. And he gives each of them a new pair of clothes. He gives Benjamin five plus 300 shekels of silver. I guess he's the favorite. And he says, don't quarrel 
on your journey. And he sends them provisions, 10 donkeys of provisions, 10 donkeys of food, all the best of the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh says, you don't even need to bring anything with you. Just come. I'll give you everything you need out of the land. And, and so they go back to their father, to Jacob, and they say, Joseph is alive. But Jacob is numb. He doesn't believe his sons. And so they recount to him all that happened in the land of Egypt, all that Joseph said, all that Joseph has done. And Jacob says, my son is alive. It will be enough for me to see him before I die. So they pack up all the wagons and all their things, and they start heading to the land of Egypt. And when they get to Beersheba, they offer sacrifices to the Lord and the Lord comes to Jacob. He says, Jacob, Jacob, do not fear to go down to Egypt. You will go down there, and I will bring you back, your family back here. And I will go with you. So they go down to the land of Egypt. And they settle in the land of Goshen, and they do get the best of the land of Egypt. But by the way, they did bring all of their stuff, too, with them. And Jacob is able to go before Pharaoh. And when Jacob is before Pharaoh, Jacob blesses Pharaoh. Remember back to Genesis chapter 12? All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. It's one step on this journey. Jacob blesses Pharaoh. They dwell and settle in the land. There's five more years of famine to go, by the way. And, and so Joseph keeps doing his job. He gets all the man, money in the land of Egypt, all the money in the land of Canaan. They run out of all their money, and so they say, well, what else can we sell? They say, well, sell me all of your livestock, and I'll give you food. Good thing Joseph's brothers are shepherds. Uh, and so they buy all this livestock from all the people in the land of Egypt, all the people in the land of Canaan, until there's nothing left in the livestock. And so then they say, we have nothing else but ourselves and our land. We will give you ourselves if you will just give us food. And so Joseph makes the deal. Give one-fifth of your crops to Pharaoh every year. You live off of four-fifths of it. And your land and yourselves will belong to Pharaoh. Now, the end of Jacob's life was coming, and he knew it. So he called Joseph to himself, and he said, Make a promise to me. When I die, take me back and bear me in the land of Canaan. Bear me in the cave where Abraham and Sarah were. Isaac and Rebecca, where my wife Leah is already buried, buried me there. So Joseph made that promise to his father. And then he brought his sons with him to see his father. And Jacob said, your two oldest sons, the ones that were born here before I got here, I want them to be mine now. They will get my inheritance. They will be among my children, just like Reuben and Simeon are my children. And so he brought Manasseh and Ephraim to his father to bless him. And he put Manasseh, the oldest, under his right hand. And he put Reuben, uh, Manasseh, Ephraim, the youngest, under his father's left hand. So he will bless them. The right hand being the better of the two for the older of the two. And what does Jacob do? And he blesses Joseph. And Joseph tries to switch his hands. He says, no, no, this is the older. He says, I know. And he switches his hands. He says, the younger will be more prominent than the older. And so what you'll find, actually, if you read through the tribes of Israel, Joseph's name's usually not there. Usually his son's names are. And they're usually younger before older, Ephraim, then Manasseh. And they have an inheritance among their father. And then he brings all of his family in, all of his 12 sons, and he blesses each of them. But he doesn't just bless them. He talks about their life. He talks about their future. He talks about what's going to happen in each of their tribes moving forward. And in particular, he says to Judah, 
the one who's taken the lead all along the way for good or for bad by this point. The deceptor will not leave your house. Your brothers will bow down to you. All the days of this family. He blesses the other sons as well. He passes away. Joseph closes his eyes. Joseph weeps on his father. And then 40 days to embalm him. 70 days of mourning by the Egyptians over the death of Jacob. And they take him back to the land. Mourn again seven days when they enter the land of Canaan. They bury him in his father's grave. In his grandfather's grave. And then they all return. And Joseph's brothers can get together and say, we need to go tell Joseph that dad said, make sure you forgive us. They're afraid that now that dad's gone, that Joseph will take his revenge. And so they go to Joseph and say, well, before dad passed away, he said, make sure you forgive your brothers for the wrong that they have done. And Joseph looks on them. We find it in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. He says, do not fear, for am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. We find that Joseph ultimately lives 110 years. And then he asked his brothers to make a promise. He says, God's going to take us out of this land eventually. When they do, take my bones with you. So when Moses leads the people out of the land of Egypt, the, the day after the Passover, you know what they make sure they take with them? Life doesn't always go the way we expect it to, does it? It doesn't always follow the path we planned. Actually, I find that in my life, it rarely follows the path I planned. But the choice I have is how am I going to respond? We see here Joseph had every reason to respond poorly to the situation in his life. He is dealt a raw deal, isn't he? But every step along the way, we find that God is with him. And that things continue to go well for him, even in the midst of life seemingly going poorly for him. So in our lives, when things don't go as we plan, do we look to God in the midst of those times? Do we see that God is with us still? Do we see that God is still in control even if we don't know what's going on in the world around us? And, and now we don't need to be naive. What Joseph's brothers did was wrong. They meant it for evil. They wanted to do harm to him. There is sin in this world. There are people who do bad things in this world. Some of the things that happen to us in this world is because there is evil and pain in the world around us. But even in the midst of that, we have a God who is greater than sin and greater than evil and greater than pain in this world. And we can turn to God in the midst of whatever's going on in our world and in our lives. Because we have a God who is in control and a God who ultimately wants good good for us and good for the world around us. And he is seeking after that good. And then Joseph has one other choice to make. How is he going to treat his brothers? The brothers who couldn't speak shalom to him, who wanted evil for him, who wanted to kill him, who ultimately sold him into slavery in Egypt. How is he going to treat those guys? We find that when they couldn't speak shalom to him, he could speak shalom to them. And no matter what they had done to him along the way, forgiveness is ultimately what came from Joseph to his brothers. 
how can we forgive like that? I mean, do you have somebody in your life and you say, I can't forgive them. You don't know what they have done to me. I can't forgive them. I mean, look at Joseph's story. Look at God's story. What have we done to him? I mean, yet God sent Jesus to die on the cross to forgive us. If we've been forgiven in that way, we must forgive others in the same way. You look at 2020 and everybody had their plans, right? Vision 2020. I don't know how many organizations, schools, whatever, had a Vision 2020. How many of their visions came to, to light this year? We all have plans, and I can venture to say that none of us have gone according to plan, at least this year. But our question is, who will we turn to? Who will we rely on? And what will our attitude be? Will we let His love and His forgiveness shine through us to the world who desperately needs Him? Can you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who continues to work out good. As we remember from Romans 8, 28, God, you work all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purposes. We trust that you are still a God who in the midst of this world works good for your people. Lord, may we not miss what you are doing in the world. May we not miss what you are doing in our lives. May we be a people who have our eyes fixed on you no matter what happens in the world around us. And may that guide what we do and how we treat those around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us at South Park Baptist Church this morning. We know life doesn't always go the way we expect it to, but I am grateful and thankful that we have God who's there for us every step along the way. And God wants you to know him. And so if you want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, or if you want to just have somebody to pray with you along the difficulty that life throws your way, we're here for you. You can call us at the church office. You can email me at chad at southparkchurch.net. We'd love to be here for you along every step of the way. Now as we go this week, May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance on you and give you peace.